man wala. We begin as always with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by sending peace and blessings upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family and upon his companions. What I want to do in this next 15 minutes is just to welcome everybody and to set the sort of stall out for what we're going to be doing for the rest of the day. It's going to be a long day. This is an intensive full day course. It's not a course that's going to take an hour or half an hour and you're going to finish it. So we're expecting to be here until somewhere between four and five o'clock this evening. With plenty of breaks, breaks for lunch and plenty of inshallah opportunity for questions and answers and dialogue and participation inshallah. Before we get into what the course is going to cover today, inshallah, I would like to start first of all by thanking all of you for attending. Because of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man lam yashkur nas lam yashkur Allaha azza wa jal. The one who doesn't thank the people, he hasn't thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as part of thanking Allah Azza wa Jal, we thank everyone for taking the time and giving up your Saturday to come and to listen. We'd also like to thank the brothers and the sisters who organized this from the, from the ISOC, from the Northumbria ISOC. And I think this inshaAllah ta'ala, we hope will be the first of many courses that are delivered through the ISOC. And it's really nice because I travel all over the country and I, I deliver lectures all over the country and indeed abroad. And when I deliver lectures all over the country, I go to places like Birmingham and places like London. And when we deliver lectures there, we see a room that is packed full of people. And it's really nice today, mashallah, tabarakallah, to see plenty of people, mashallah, we filled up a good amount of the room, especially on the sister's side. There's a lot of people have come today and that's a fantastic thing. And this is something we want to see more in Newcastle. Because otherwise, I travel to London to deliver a lecture to 100 people. I'd much rather do that in Newcastle where it's easier for me and it's more benefit to the people in the local area. So this is just an encouragement to the Islamic society and to all of the people who are involved and all of the people who've come from other masajid and Islamic societies today to gather together and to establish these kinds of events. Not just for me, but for all of the other speakers and lecturers who deliver these kinds of lectures. Because Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of people in the UK who go and learn Islam, they come back and they teach it to the people. I would like to see lots of them coming to Newcastle on a regular basis. And Newcastle becoming known as an area where people go to learn about Islam. But that is going to take time and it's going to be through events like this that we establish that kind of practice Again, before we touch upon what we're going to actually talk about today, I also would like to touch upon some rules. And these rules are pretty simple and they're just basic, normal rules. Most of your university students and you're completely used to these things. Mobile phones, please switch off or on silent. If you have to leave the room during the lecture, please do so quietly and respectfully. Don't push everyone out the way, answer your phone, yeah, 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 I'm talking, and then sort of walk out the door. At least, you know, sort of cancel the call, go out quietly and then take the call outside and so on and so forth. When it comes to the issues we're going to be talking about today, they are issues that will stir up a lot of emotions in people. Because we're talking about our core belief as Muslims. And maybe some of the things I'm going to say, I don't know, perhaps not all of you in this room are going to agree with what everything that I say. So what we have to do is establish that our dialogue is going to be based upon mutual respect for each other's opinions and upon discussion based upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And we're not going to get into a slang match and we're not going to get into this isn't my belief and this is yours and so on and so forth. I'm here today to present the belief of a Muslim throughout the day. And inshallah, I'm sure most of what I say, if not all of what I say, will not be a problem for anybody. But in case there are certain issues, then inshallah, there's no problem for us to discuss them. The questions are open, there's nothing that you can't ask. But on top of that, the questions have to be based, they have to be respectful, and the answers have to be respectful as well. 
and it's the point is for us to learn the truth for us to come to the truth based upon the Quran and upon the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not for us to base it upon ideologies or partisanship or sectarianism or any other sort of uh, false basis for agreeing things or nationalism or madahib or any other issue we're going to come to the conclusion based upon the Quran and based upon the Sunnah and based upon the evidence and the questions are open, there's nothing that you can't ask, inshallah ta'ala. The only other rule that I really have, in all honesty, is that you do your best to take notes, that you do your best to listen, because it is like the, the very state, it's very famous statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, when he said, Qayyidu al-ilma bil kitabah. That is that make your knowledge firm by writing it down. So when you sit there and you listen, you might remember some things and you might forget others. But the reality is that when you make notes, and I don't think you have to write down everything I'm saying, but you write down the major points, things that are relevant to you, then this inshallah is a method by which that you can uh, inshallah learn and you can remember what it is that you have learned. Because I think many of you here today most likely, I would say, have almost certainly attended a lecture that I've given before or a khutbah that I've given before. And I'm almost sure that many of the things that I'm going to mention today will already have been mentioned in previous classes and lectures on khutbahs. So the question is, how good is our recollection of those things? Usually that's because we don't write down and we don't revise what it is that we've written. And so at the end, we're going to have some questions and answers, and we're going to try to come to some conclusions. The sort of level of the class that we're going through today, I think it's neither a beginner's class, nor is it a particularly advanced workshop. By not being a beginner's class, I'm not going to go to the most absolutely fundamental things that we only believe in one God and you know that we believe that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger as I might do if there were a lot of non-Muslims present. I'm going to presume that you have a basic understanding of what Islam is. I'm going to presume that you have a basic understanding of the most simple terms in Islam like what the word sunnah means and we might mention a few of these other things. At the same time, I understand that not all of you will be at the same level in terms of your learning, so I'm not making this class an extremely, extremely difficult class. We are going to touch upon some of the more difficult topics in belief, or in the topic of belief, towards the end of the workshops. And we are going to touch upon philosophy, and we're going to touch upon the impact of philosophy on Islam. And that is a very difficult subject, and it is a subject that will hurt your head, unless you're incredibly, incredibly bright, and that's the, the, the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. It is a difficult subject, but those will be left for small parts of the workshop rather than the main part of the workshop. So I haven't come here today to talk about all of the different, you know, sort of, philosophical sects and groups and how their philosophies impacted upon Islam and how Greek terminology affected Islam and so on and so forth and how Aristotle's works were imported and why Aristotle differed from Plato. I'm not going to talk too much about that today because that is going to make people sort of find their workshop very, very difficult. But at the same time, what we are going to do is touch upon certain things so that you're at least aware that Islam has gone through a phase where it has been impacted by other religions and other religious beliefs and other non-religious beliefs and how those beliefs have impacted upon Islam, what they produce and some of the answers or some of the solutions to dealing with these kind of or this kind of interference that might come from other beliefs and other religions or other methodologies that were alien to Islam. The last thing that I'll mention inshallah uh, before we begin the actual program is that insha'Allah ta'ala there will be notes made available to you. I'm actually going to deliver this course again in Keithley, I think, uh, in a few weeks time. As part of that, they are producing a, a formal booklet on the topics that are being taught 
and inshallah I've more or less agreed with them that copies of the booklets inshallah with the help of the ISOC will be distributed to those people who want them either electronically or either in printed form. So inshallah take your notes but be in the ta'ala you will also receive a pack. You won't get it today because we're waiting for the brothers from Keithley to produce that pack for us. But inshallah based on today they're going to probably take the audio from today, produce a, a you know set of notes and a pack and sort of then hand that back to you guys as an extra, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I think that's enough uh, for the introduction, except to talk about what it is that we're going to do today, which is the main part. Now, what we're going to do today is split into five sessions, okay? Each session lasts about 45 minutes, and there will be time for questions and answers. After each session, you're going to get roughly a 15-minute break, 10 to 15-minute break, and there will be an hour and 15 minute break for Dhuhr and lunch and of course we will take some time as well for Asr uh, as it comes and I don't think we're going to be here at Maghrib time except perhaps when we leave we might leave and, and go for Maghrib inshallah the sessions are split into five the first session we're going to deal with is an introduction to the topic of Aqeedah that's what we've come to talk about today Aqeedah and that is Roughly in English, A Q E E D A H, and it roughly corresponds to the word creed or belief or fundamentals of belief or something like that. I think we tried this last time, it doesn't really go off. So, Akida is what we've come to talk about today, and that's what we're going to be talking about in session one. What is Akida? What does it mean to have a fundamental set of beliefs? What is the aqidah of a Muslim? Where do we get our beliefs from as Muslims? Where are we allowed to take our beliefs uh, from? We're also going to talk about what, what our, this topic of creed covers and what it doesn't cover. So which kind of things would you expect in a class on creed and which kind of things would you not expect in a class on creed? We're also going to talk about differences of opinions when it comes to our belief, differences of opinions. Because we'll know that the Muslims have not agreed upon every single thing. So what are these differences? Where do they come? Where do they come from? And how should we deal with them? Do we reject any difference? Do we accept some and reject others? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about the issue of taqlid when it comes to aqidah. Taqlid. And taqlid is this concept of blindly following or attributing your belief as coming from somebody so we're going to talk about the ruling of that in Islam so we're going to talk about not taqlid in terms of your fiqh, your madhab, how you pray or how you fast or whatever but we're going to talk about in terms of your beliefs that you hold what the ruling of blindly following somebody in those beliefs uh, is we're also going to talk about fundamental principles of belief and we're going to talk about famous people who wrote about belief in Islam and we're also going to talk a little bit about how Islamic beliefs were written down through the ages how they were written down at the time of the Sahaba and at the time of the Tabi'een and so on and so forth and, and who the, the first or early people to write about this topic were um, and that will probably conclude for us the first session in the second session, inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to talk about La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah in detail so that everybody understands. Because this is the foundation of everything we believe as a Muslim. This is what enters you into Islam when you accept Islam as a new Muslim and you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadun Rasulullah. This is what makes you a Muslim. So we should understand this as the foundation of the Muslim belief and what it means. In session 3, insha'Allah ta'ala, we're going to cover some more advanced topics in Aqeedah. Things that are a little bit more difficult than just La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. From those things that we're going to have a brief look at is advanced topics when it comes to the belief in Allah. We're going to have a little look at Qadr, predestination. We're going to have a little look at the, our belief regarding the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet And we are also probably going to have a little bit of a look at the concept of obedience and rebellion in Islam. 
So that is obedience to Allah, His Messenger and to other people and disobedience and rebellion because I think that's a current topic that's going on in the world today and the more it happens in the Muslim world, the more you guys should be aware of the role of obedience and rebellion and what the Muslim belief says about obedience and rebellion. Inshallah, in the fourth session, we're going to cover deviation in Aqidah. What it means to be deviated. What it means to go astray in your belief. And how this going astray uh, works, what its limits are, what it means to go astray. And then we're going to cover a little bit of a history of deviancy in Islam. Because clearly when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, there wasn't a lot of people who went astray. Because he pretty much kept them on the right path. After he died, it started slowly, 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 and it snowballed until it became a huge problem which the majority of Muslims in the world are afflicted with today. One form of deviance or another in the topic of Aqidah. And when you learn about this, you will see that it isn't an, it isn't, uh, an exaggeration to say that the majority of Muslims in the world today are afflicted with deviancy in their belief in one place or another. And then finally, in session five, we're going to talk about moving forward. We're going to talk about how we apply what we've learned and we're going to do a lot of questions and answers and fight, you know, try and iron out sort of any of the details that have been problematic for people and talk about how we progress from here, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, that takes us to the end of the introduction. Do we have any questions about what we're going to do today? Before, before you start, <coughs> Omer, yeah, I was going to ask him to distribute the papers for those not happy. Okay, that's a good idea, inshallah. Inshallah, if anyone would like a paper, we're going to go around handing out paper, inshallah, now to make notes and pens. There is some paper on the back for the sisters as well. There is some paper on the back for the sisters as well, we're told. Can everybody hear me okay? Can the sisters at the back hear me okay? I'll presume if anyone can't hear me okay, that you'll tell me. We have a stronger mic over there, but I like to wander around. I don't like to stand in one place, so... I like to make difficulty for the camera, camera people and, you know, subhanAllah. Okay, let's make a, a start because the more we end up being delayed, the more it's going to end up into a cumulative effect and we're going to get delayed in everything. So this is session one, this is 45 minutes of an introduction to the topic of Aqidah. The topic of Aqidah, which for want of a better word in English we're going to call creed. Creed, core beliefs, essential beliefs, fundamentals of belief, whatever you want to call it, these are all names that have been used for it in the past. The essentials of belief, the foundations of belief, the fundamentals of belief, what a Muslim should believe, the matters that are essential to the belief of every Muslim, the Muslim's creed, a, Muslim, a Muslim's uh, you know, theology. All of these are words that are used. I'm going to use creed for the most point, but the word aqidah, in, inshallah, will be understood to everybody. To begin with the definition of the word aqidah, you know when we have words in the sharia, any word in the sharia, salah, zakah, hajj, Salm, all of these words that come in Islam, they have a linguistic meaning and they have a technical meaning. And that's true of all words in Islam. Okay? So as for, let me take an example, Salah. Does anybody know, other than Basak, does anybody know what the linguistic meaning of the word Salah is? Not the word, not the prayer, before the prayer what the linguistic meaning of the word Salah in Arabic is. Anyone want to have a guess? Okay, there's a guess connection. That's close. This comes from very close because she's thinking of the word Sila, which means to connect something. But before that, there's a word. The, the word Salah. Dua. Salah in the language of the Arabs is Dua. This is what the word salah means, a dua. Now, 
That doesn't mean that when we pray, all we do is make dua. There is a linguistic definition and there is a technical definition. So if we have a look at, for example, the word psalm, fasting, we find that psalm is to refrain from anything, to refrain from doing something. Al imsak, to keep away from, you know, hold yourself away from doing something. So, for example, to hold yourself away from talking, to stop, uh, you know, looking, to stop walking, to stop moving. All of these can be described linguistically as song, but we know what fasting means in Islam, it's different. And likewise, hajj, and likewise, all of these words. So, aqidah is no different. And aqidah originally comes from aqadah. And aqadah is to tie something or for something to become hard and strong or for something to be held onto these are all the meanings of aqada in arabic linguistically so to tie something up arabt to tie something up or to tie two things together likewise at tamassuk to hold on to something tight and not let it go likewise uh, what they call a salb, something being hard and, and, and sort of rough and heavy. And, you know, there are other uh, meanings as well. To take something, to grasp something, this is also from the meanings of aqada, especially i'tiqad, the word i'tiqad, it can be used to mean i'tiqad, to, to take something and to grab onto it. And if we look in the sharia, in the Quran, and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we don't find a Sharia or a Shari definition of the word Aqidah that is any different from the linguistic definition. And the rule is in this, that if we don't find a definition in the Sharia which differs from the language of the Arabs, then we just go back to the language of the Arabs and we suffice ourselves with that. So Aqidah in a very broad sense, in a technical sense, is are those beliefs that we hold on to, that we put into our heart, that we cling to, that we make ourselves firm with. All of these linguistic meanings relate to our beliefs. So things in our belief that we grab onto and we hold on to, things that we remain strong and firm upon, we don't change in them, they don't change, they don't vary. And you know, things that we uh, tie ourselves to in a certain way, we sort of link ourselves to. These are all things that are sort of to get you a bit nearer to the meaning of the Sharia. Now, in terms of the very technical definition of Aqidah, some of the people have said that Aqidah is basically the six pillars of Iman. Some people came along and they said Aqidah is the six pillars of Iman. So Aqidah is that you believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers and the last day and you believe in predestination, the good of it and the bad of it. And this isn't a bad way of explaining Aqidah but it, all, it misses out certain issues in Aqidah which develop later on. But there's no doubt that the majority of what we're going to talk about today can be classified under the belief in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, and the belief in the last day, and the belief in Qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. What should we add on to that to get a more comprehensive understanding of what this topic is going to be about? We should add on to that all those issues which the Muslims as a united body hold firm to and which they take as part of their fundamental beliefs. So there are certain issues outside of these six things that Muslims hold on to and they form a fundamental or a core part of the religion of Islam. And so we can add into that our belief about the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, because this forms a fundamental part of our belief in Islam. 
Likewise, we can add on to that the concept of obedience to those in authority because this forms a fundamental part of Islam. This is something that a Muslim is recognized by. This is something that forms the core of the theological sort of aspect of Islam. It's also important to note that the essence or the base of Aqidah is in the heart. So all of these things are things that we believe in our hearts. And they are things that we put in our hearts and we affirm upon and we worship Allah by. I.e. we hold these to be the set of beliefs that distinguish those who Allah loves from those who Allah does not love. So we say that deviancy in these beliefs or going astray in these beliefs is going to lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not loving you, not being pleased with you, and likewise that is only going to lead to further punishment and so on and so forth in the hereafter. So these kind of core beliefs, once we understand what we're talking about, we're not talking about how we pray, we're not talking about how we fast, we're not talking about whether we should place our hands on our chests or on our navel, we're not talking about whether we should raise the hands in the prayer after, after the ruku or not raise the hands. These are su supplementary issues in the terms of the halal and the haram. We are talking very clearly about those core beliefs that every Muslim puts in their heart and says, this is what I am defined by as a Muslim. These are the beliefs that define me as a Muslim. Because my brother in Islam can stand next to me and he can pray a bit different from me. But he still defines himself as a Muslim in the same way that I do. And that is why Aqidah is such an important topic. Because it defines you as a Muslim. Anyone can say they're a Muslim. We can see examples of huge differences in the world. Look from country to country, from person to person. Any person of these people can say that they are a Muslim. But the question is, what defines you as a Muslim? What are those core sets of beliefs that you put in your heart and you say, this is what I say Islam is. This is what I hold Islam to be. These are these beliefs that I tie into my heart and I lock into my heart. They never change and they never waver. They are what makes me strong and what makes me firm. They are what I take and I hold on to fast. So this is what Aqidah is. So we have to be clear that those are the sort of issues we're going to talk about and we're not going to talk today a lot about fiqh issues, we're not going to talk about the halal and the haram, we're not going to talk about whether it's recommended or disliked, we're not going to talk very much about the role of various acts of worship, we're going to talk very specifically about those core sets of belief that you put in your heart and you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon those core sets of belief that you have in your heart. And they are what define you as a Muslim. Having said that, we must be very clear that our belief does not stop in the heart. And one of the deviancies in belief is to say that all of your belief and all of your Iman rests only in here. And this is not true. <coughs> In reality, the heart has an effect on the body. And we know the famous hadith, Ala wa inna fil jasadi muqdah, ida saluhat, saluha al jasadu kullu, wa ida fasadat, fasad al jasadu kullu, ala wa hi al qalb. Indeed, there is a piece of flesh in the body. If this piece of flesh is upright, the whole body will be upright. And if this piece of flesh is corrupt, the whole body will be corrupt and indeed it is the heart. So the heart has an effect on the body. And there is what uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah so aptly called talazum bayna zahiri wal batin. He said there is a link between your inner self and your outer self. It is not that your outer self is something that just wanders around and your inner self is completely pure. Your outer self is drinking and fornicating and lying and swearing and backbiting and your inner self is worshipping Allah. It doesn't work like that. There is a strong link between your inner self and between your outer self. 
So as for your inner self, if your inner self is pure and worshipping Allah and thinking about Allah and is based upon strong and, and, and fundamental beliefs, then inshaAllah ta'ala your outer self will show some of that. That doesn't mean that you'll be free from sin. That doesn't mean you'll never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's no doubt that the more you correct your heart and the more you correct these fundamental beliefs, the more this will have a massive effect on your outer self. And that's why some people are very, very scared to learn about Islam. Have you ever seen some people who aren't practicing Islam at all? And you say to them, come to the masjid. Or you say to them, come on, let's, let's go out and let's have a meal and we'll chat. Sometimes these people are more scared of learning Islam than anything else. They're not scared of you as a bearded Muslim or as a sister wearing a hijab. They're scared of learning Islam because they're scared. They know that when they learn it and when they start to correct that heart, their actions will be corrected. And you actually see some people will admit this and they will say, I'm frightened that if I start to pray, my whole life is going to change. Because they know the more that you correct your heart, the more your outer self will be corrected and this will lead to the purification of the soul and the purification of the heart. Another reason why Aqidah is so critical and so fundamentally important is because the messengers, all of them began by teaching it. And if you want an example of this, there are two key examples that you can take to prove that all of the messengers began by teaching Aqidah. The first is if you look at some of the surahs of the Quran, like Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh surah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes through a lot of messengers, one after the other after the other. And to each one of them he says, and so and so came to his people saying, worship Allah, you have no God worthy of worship except him. So we see that the prophets and the messengers began by teaching people their beliefs and correcting people's beliefs before anything else. This is the first point. The second point, which you can add to this as a sub-issue from this point, or as a, as a secondary issue in this point, is that you will not find any disagreement in what the messengers taught in terms of their core beliefs. Yes, some of the umam, some of the, umam, some of the, some of the, uh, the past nations were allowed to eat pork, and some of them weren't. And some of them were allowed to eat the fat of the animal, and some of them weren't. And some of them had to pray five times a day, and some of them had to pray three times a day, and some of them had to pray once a day, and some of them had to pray twice a day. But you don't find any difference in the Qur'an from the beginning to the end in what these prophets taught in their core and fundamental beliefs. And this is why all of the prophets are described with Islam. All of the prophets are described with Islam. How can you possibly say that Jesus was a Muslim? How can you possibly say that Musa, Moses, was a Muslim? How can you possibly say that Abraham was a Muslim? Very, very simple. From two points of view. First of all, because the word Muslim means to submit. And all of them submitted to Allah in, complete, in, in, their, in, 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 in its entirety. And secondly, and this is the point I want to make here, is their belief set, their core beliefs that they put into their heart did not change. So they had no difference in what they believed. Yes, they had a difference in their religious rulings in terms of the halal and the haram. We know that Isa, Jesus, when he came, it's mentioned in the Quran that he said, وَلِيُحِلَّ لَكُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي حُرِّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ said, I make, I've come to make halal for you some of the things that were haram for you before. But this halal and this haram was not in the topic or in the area of the core beliefs. The core beliefs, the fundamentals, the creed of those prophets was the same from the beginning to the end. Secondly, or the second point that I want to make to show you the importance of this with regard to the prophets. I want you to look in the Quran when you have some time at the Makkan chapters, the Makkan surahs. The surahs that were revealed in Makkah. And the Prophet وسلم, spent 13 years in Makkah. In that 13 years in Makkah, for the majority of that 13 years, there was no prayer. 
There was no fasting. There was no hajj. There was no zakah. And essentially, the only thing that he spent this 13 years doing, except for the very, very latter period, perhaps, the very last you know, few years, was focusing on purifying the beliefs of the people. So you find that alcohol was not made haram, and you find that you know, there was no attention given to the hijab. You find all of these things came later on, either in the latter years of Makkah, right at the end, or either in Medina. And most of them came in Medina. Medina was the time where most of the halal and the haram came. Yes, the prayer was revealed in Makkah, but it was revealed towards the latter period of the life of the Prophet ﷺ in Makkah. Likewise, the fasting at the very, very end. The zakah was not revealed until Medina, or certainly not in its entirety until Medina. Likewise, fighting and you know, military expeditions and defending the lands and all of these other things were not revealed until the very, very, very either end of Makkah or the beginning of Medina. We know fighting was revealed after a couple of years in Medina. So what we see is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam focused his initial teachings upon belief, correcting the people's belief. And that's why the key points of belief we're going to talk about in these five sessions today are all found in the Makkan Surahs. And very little is found in the Madani Surahs, the Surahs from Medina. That is just what is found in the Surahs from Medina is to enforce what came before. But the beginning, the first revelation of these issues of avoiding the idols and worshipping Allah and following the Messenger and obedience and so on and so forth, these issues primarily, most of them, not quite all of them, but most of them were revealed in Makkah and more than that they were revealed in the early part of Makkah. And so as we see time developing, we see more sophistication, more rules coming in, we see people being developed in their, you know, their spiritual sense. We see people praying and fasting and giving the zakah. And then at the very end of the life of the Prophet وسلم, performing the hajj and so on and so forth. <coughs> but we don't see the attention given to acts of worship in Makkah that was given to acts of worship in the latter part of Makkah and the early part of Medina. Again, we don't see social or sociological and political aspects until Medina. So in the early years of Makkah, 10 years approximately, between 7 and 10 years of in Makkah approximately, is spent purely dealing with belief. And if the Prophet wasallam stayed with us as a Prophet for 23 years, and he spent approximately half of his time focusing only on belief, then this should show us the importance of belief to us as Muslims, the importance of belief in relation to the other aspects of Islam and you can see you know the importance of other aspects you can see the Salah was revealed you know towards the latter part of Makkah and then this was something which was given a lot of importance to but this early time is given towards correcting the beliefs and that's because if the beliefs are correct it's going to lead to an uprightness and a steadfastness in the body as well Okay, we have a couple of important principles to cover. The first one is the issue of taqlid or, and the issue of differences of opinion in aqidah. In fact, before that, let's take, a, let's take a step back because we need to talk about something before that and that is where we get our aqidah from. Because we can't talk about the differences until we talk about where we get it from. We get our aqidah from three sources and three sources alone. There is no fourth source. Three sources. One source is the Book of Allah, the Quran. The Quran is a fundamental source where we get our belief set from. So the Quran, in its initial revelation, came revealing, and in more than anything, the Quran is a book of belief. More than the Qur'an is a book of action and more than the Qur'an is a book of rulings. Maybe the Sunnah came with a lot of rulings after that. But the Qur'an, if it is nothing else, it is a book of Aqidah. 
it deals the most important thing and the topic that is repeated again and again and again and again in the Quran. Far more than the prayer and far more than the zakah, it is repeated on every page and to the point where Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said it is found within every ayah. He said there is no ayah of the Quran that does not contain it. Meaning that the whole of Islam was established for this purpose and this purpose alone. So these beliefs are found from within the Quran. They are also found within the second source of revelation that we have. Because revelation in Islam is of two types. We have two kinds of revelation. We have revelation that we worship Allah by reading it or by reciting it. And we have revelation that we don't worship Allah by reciting it. The revelation that we worship Allah by reciting is the Quran. And the revelation that we don't worship Allah by reciting is what was revealed to the Prophet And the Quran sets this up as a fundamental principle. This is what we're going to talk about in session two. The Quran sets up a fundamental principle. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى Allah says that the Messenger of Allah does not speak from his own opinion. From his own desire. He doesn't just say whatever comes into his mind. Whatever he says is a revelation that is revealed by Allah. So if the sunnah is a revelation that is revealed by Allah. If the sunnah is a revelation that is revealed by Allah. Then this is our secondary source of beliefs. And this is a critical source. Why? Because the Quran as a book in general is very general it's very it gives you an overview and it doesn't deal with many of the specifics the sunnah comes along and it clarifies the quran it explains the quran and it further expands upon the issues that are mentioned within the quran so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we have sent down to you the dhikr we have sent down to you the remembrance that you can explain to the people what was revealed to them. So Allah is talking about two things. We've sent you down something to explain to people what was revealed to them. This something that was sent down to explain to people what was revealed to them is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah And this can be found in a very famous hadith. I have left you two things. You will not go astray as long as you hold on to them, the book of Allah and my sunnah. So this is a critical hadith telling us that these two things are both revelation and they are the two that are going, you're going to be holding on to. What is the third source do we think? Does anybody know what the third source of, of belief for ourselves as Muslims is? Anybody know? We have three sources. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah, and we have a third source. Scholars? Okay, the brother said the scholars. That's a good guess and it's not wrong. It's getting there. But we want to be a bit more specific because, for example, I have a scholar who says to me the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah, and there's a scholar who says to me that the Quran is partially created. So I can't possibly take the two of them together. So which scholars, or how many scholars, or in what kind of belief? Sahabi. The Sahaba, that's also not a bad answer, and we're also getting here. But even the Sahaba, in certain issues, differed. For example, they differed over the ayah, يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقْ The day when a shin will be uncovered. And they held different opinions about this ayah. So again, I need something a bit more specific. <coughs> Sister, right at the back. The consensus, consensus, al-ijma. Why are we allowed to take consensus as a proof for our belief? It's because of something we find in the Sunnah. Just like, imagine this like sort of a Russian doll sort of syndrome. The Quran tells us to follow the Sunnah, right? Follow me on this, yeah? The Quran tells us to follow the Sunnah and the Sunnah tells us that we are allowed to follow the consensus of the Muslims because of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, my Ummah will not come together and agree upon falsehood 
So you will never get a time when the Ummah comes together as a whole Ummah and agrees upon something that isn't true. Now we have to be a bit careful. Because the sister, she mentioned something very interesting and I, I'm going to mention it to you now rather than at the beginning. She said the consensus of the Sahaba. And that shows a lot of fiqh. That shows a good understanding. Because if we said the consensus of anybody and everybody, we'd be a bit stuck. Northumbria Isaac agrees that <coughs> sisters don't have to wear hijab. That's not consensus. Okay, how do you prove the whole Muslim Ummah agreed? How do you know there isn't a woman living in China who doesn't agree? We have to have something a bit more precise than that. So some of the scholars, they said, Ijma is the consensus of the Sahaba and that is it. Full stop. Some of them said. They said, Ijma is the consensus of the companions. Full stop. So whatever the companions, because they were fairly small in number, and you know, if we didn't, basically, if we see that they all agreed on something and none of them put their hand up and said, I don't agree here, or we don't have any proof that they disagreed, we consider this to be ijma. But most of the ulama in Islam, they expand ijma to a little bit bigger than that. And they say it is the agreement of the scholars of any particular time, as in any particular age, as in if all of the scholars of the Sunnah or all of the scholars who are upright in Islam agree on a certain issue in a particular time range, then though then that is considered to be ijma. But there are certain principles and we're not going to go into a sort of fiqh all day and talk about ijma, but you know you can't have ijma that breaks ijma. So you can't have the companions agree something and say we've agreed upon it and then say right the ulama of today have all agreed the companions were wrong. Because that doesn't work. Their first agreement established the consensus and that consensus cannot be broken because the Prophet ﷺ said my ummah cannot come together upon falsehood. They will never ever come together upon something which is wrong. So what we, we find is that... It's